Hello everyone, thank you very much for um, coming along uh, virtually and I'm going to talk today about generational differences in how we interpret and react to social cues. So I'm Louise Phillips from the School of Psychology in Aberdeen and I've been here a very long time um, but um, what I'm really interested in is the process of ageing, adult ageing and how that kind of impacts on all kind of different aspects of our life. So why might be in, we be interested in um, age differences in social decoding then? Okay, let me just get my mouse lined up. There we go. So um, the population is getting older and we're living longer and that's a really good thing. Um, but for example, there's an Age UK report that came out recently which suggested that older adults are more likely to be lonely than people from other age groups. And also that intergenerational contacts particularly important for older adults well-being so when i say intergenerational contact i just mean um, being able to connect with and communicate with people from different generations um, but there's also evidence that um, over time we actually have less and less intergenerational contact because of just changes in the way that society is these days so we have less intergenerational contact but it's particularly important for um, a lot of older people and we also know that being socially isolated, not having lots of communication with people increases susceptibility, not just to um, you know, feeling more lonely and feeling like you have poor mental health, but also in terms of physical illness and early mortality. So it is really important that people engage socially as much as they would like to. And of course, much more difficult in days of COVID as well. So what my topic of research is and what I'm going to talk about today is evidence of age differences between younger adults roughly um, aged 18 to 40 and older adults roughly aged 60 plus age differences between these groups in terms of social communication and particularly in the way that we interpret social cues and what implications that might have for intergenerational communication and interactions so i've mentioned this idea of social cues what do i mean by that um, so social cue decoding is about identifying what other people are thinking or feeling uh, from the kind of cues that they give you. And that could be cues um, from the words that they use, or it could be the way that they um, move their face, their facial expressions. It could be to do with the tone of the voice. It could be to do with bodily gestures. She said frantically gesturing in the background. Um, so all of these different things tell us something about what other people are thinking or feeling. And so we carry out things all the time. We're constantly identifying what emotions, what feelings somebody else has. We often make eye contact with people and look where they're looking. We follow their gaze and we pick up on cues to their mental state. What do they intend when they say something? Are they trying to deceive us? Are they being sarcastic or do they mean what they say? What do they know? What do they believe about a situation? And this social cue decoding, we're doing it all the time. And it's essential for being able to communicate with people and going through all the complexities of the social world and being able to form relationships and develop and maintain and nurture relationships with people. We're all doing this social duty coding all of the time. So why then might there be age differences between younger and older adults in social cue decoding? And there's a number of different reasons and I'll touch on all these things throughout the talk. Firstly, I don't think it's any news to anybody that some things get worse as we get older. So our perception gets worse. We don't have such acute vision and ability to kind of grasp visual details as we get older. Uh, our hearing gets worse, another form of perceptual change. Um, and also we have cognitive changes in memory and attention um, as we get older as well. And so all of those things mean that some aspects of decoding social cues may get more difficult as we get older, because sometimes social cues are subtle and fleeting. Uh, so, you know, those things could get worse as we get older. Kind of the, the opposite to that is that I guess we have a kind of lifetime of experience in social decoding. We're doing this all the time. We're always decoding social cues from other people. So perhaps actually we might be better at social decoding because we're more experienced at, at it as we get older. And this would be particularly true for kind of everyday social skills. 
Also, we might have some um, cohort differences, some generational differences in social etiquette. It may have changed across time how appropriate it is to display your emotions, for example. And then there might be motivational differences between age groups. So one of the most influential theories um, of uh, aging suggests that older people are less interested than young people in forming new social bonds with novel social partners. So maybe there might be motivational differences between age groups in terms of how you approach social decoding. So what I'm going to try and cover today a little bit at least is how younger and older people differ in social cue decoding. Where I can, I'm going to say something about why they might differ or speculate on that at least and why I think that might matter as well. And I'm going to talk about four different domains of social decoding. First one's following eye gaze. The second one is emotion perception. The third one is detecting sarcasm. And the fourth is understanding mental states. I'm going to give a kind of whistle stop tour around each of those different aspects and what we might know about age differences. I'm going to talk about age differences. I'm interested in adult age differences. There's all kinds of interesting issues about earlier in development as well. Um, and the first couple of topics I'm going to talk about, it's very important to be thinking about the eyes in particular. So we have this idea from literature, from art, uh, from philosophy, that the eyes are really important. They kind of tell us about somebody. If we can really look into someone's eyes, we know something about them. And evidence from neuroscience and psychology supports this idea that eyes are really central to social communication and that we develop an interest in eyes very, very early in development. Babies start to look at eyes very early. So they're a really important cue for um, social communication. So the first topic I'm going to talk about a little bit then is adult age differences in gaze following. So this is now all about eyes. And so gaze following is just this thing that we have that we can't help ourselves almost but look where someone else is looking. So that idea of if someone in a crowd is looking one way, we all look one way. But also in everyday interactions, if someone looks across at something, we need to look at where they're looking as well. And that's all about us um, sharing attention with other people. And there's lots of evidence that we develop this urge to follow gaze very early. So this is a kind of classic um, study from looking at the development of gaze following. So in this case, a researcher um, makes eye contact with a baby and then the researcher then looks across at one of the toys. And then shortly afterwards, the baby then looks across at the same toy. And it's this idea that um, the researcher and the baby have this bond. And when the researcher looks somewhere, the baby wants to look and see what the researcher is interested in. And this idea of gaze following, sharing gaze, um, it's, uh, it's seen as very much a precursor to understanding all kinds of mental states that other people have. So in our studies and many experimental psychology studies, we use much more constrained tasks to look at this idea of gaze following. So we might show something like this. This is an example for a task called gaze cueing task, where you see a picture of a disembodied floating head, but you'll see that the eyes are looking to one side of the screen, to the right hand side of the screen in this case. And what we're interested in looking at is whether there are adult age differences between young adults and older adults in how much you follow gaze. And when you show this kind of face on the computer screen, so what we're interested in is do people follow the gaze and look towards the right hand side of the screen? Okay, so one way that we can look at this is by using a technique called eye tracking and what eye tracking does is it uses a kind of set of cameras to quite closely follow where a participant is looking when they look at a scene on a computer so for example if you're looking at a computer screen um, through an eye tracker the eye tracker will tell us exactly where on the screen you're looking, where you're attending to, and how much you move around and uh, the time scale of how all those things work as well. So eye tracking uses a camera system to try and look at um, things like visual attention. And in this case, we're interested in what it can tell us about age differences in following gaze. So we used this method recently to look at whether younger and older people differ in following gaze. Um, and 
uh, we showed younger and older participants, so the people who take part in our studies, faces with eyes shifted to the left or right. This might be a little bit small for you to see, but in both these cases, these photographs have the eyes shifted slightly towards the, the right. So we show younger and older people lots and lots and lots of these pictures, uh, and the eyes are gazing in different directions. And what we find is that participants do follow gaze. So if you look at a picture of someone looking to the right, you tend to look to the right as well. But we found that older people followed gaze less than younger people did. So um, this was kind of surprising to us initially when we first found this, because this is usually seen as a very automatic thing that you just follow gaze without kind of thinking about it at all. And it's something that you do from very early in infancy. But we actually found that older people um, follow gaze less than young people do. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But I'm just going to mention another interesting finding, which is that older people looked less at the eyes in general and looked more at the mouth than young people did. And I'm going to come back to that. But we were interested in this finding that older people follow gaze less than young people do. Um, and why might this be the case? Well, maybe these disembodied heads in the middle of screens that we're showing people are just not very motivating for older people and just not like their experience of looking at people and interacting with people in everyday life. So one step to make this task a bit more realistic is to actually look at um, gaze cueing in real and naturalistic scenes. So that was the next study that we did. And in this task, we asked younger and older people to look um, at a photograph. Um, but this time the task was embedded in what we call a visual search task. So I'll just explain what that is. And you can kind of see how that feels when you see the actual photograph as well. So uh, we'd be given instruction like, look at the kettle. So basically that means that what participants were being asked to do is to look at the kettle in the scene that I'm about to show you. So you can do that when I show you the next slide. So there you, you have to look at the kettle. And as you will see, there's somebody else who's in the photograph and they're already looking at the kettle. Um, and so then another type of trial might be like this. So again, the task might be look at the kettle we ask the participants to do. But this time you'll see that the person in the photograph the actor in the photograph is looking at a different object at a stool. So looking at the kettle feels a little bit more difficult because your attention is drawn in a different direction. And so this, we compare these two different kinds of trials. In these gaze congruent trials, the actor in the photograph is looking at the target object at the kettle. In the gaze incongruent trials uh, down below, the actor in the scene is looking at a different object. And what we predict is that people, our participants, should be quicker to look at the kettle in the congruent compared to the incongruent trials. This is the kind of thing we love to do in experimental psychology, is set up all these different kind of um, stimuli and manipulate aspects of them. We also predicted that um, if there are age differences in gaze following, that this effect of uh, having the congruent gaze cue might be bigger for younger than for older people. Okay, so what we found was that there was there were these really strong effects of gaze direction on the time to fixate the targets. So just to explain what that means, if you're a participant doing our studies and you're looking for the kettle, you're much quicker to find the kettle and look at it if the person in the picture is looking at the kettle, just in simple terms. Um, and in particular, we were interested in, in, in these congruent trials, like the one that I'm showing you there. So there we looked at how likely were people to actually look, how likely were our participants to actually look at the distractor object, the stool in this, in this case. So that's obviously not what you're being asked to do in the trial, you're being asked to look at the kettle, but how likely are you to look at the stool in this kind of trial uh, because you can't help but follow the gaze? And that's where we found that younger participants were more likely than older people to actually look at the distractor the stool in this case, which again showed us that younger people were showing more gaze cueing than older people were in this task, even with these more naturalistic, more motivating scenes. 
So that's a quick whirlwind tour through some aspects of gaze following. And we found that older people follow gaze less than younger people do in both faces, floating in space, and also in these more realistic photographs of full scenes. So why might this be the case? Well, still, I think there could be some motivational factors that are in there. As I said before, there's a very um, influential theory of aging, which proposes that older people are less motivated by, to look at strangers, for example, than young people are. So perhaps these photographs of people that our participants don't know are not very motivating for older people. Also, there could be changes in social rules across the generation. So, for example, it might be less appropriate to look directly at a stranger and where they're looking as you get older um, or across different generations in, in, in more um, distant generations. That that kind of thing of looking at someone in the eyes and following where they're looking might have been less appropriate. Or there could be age differences in kind of perceptual capacity. So um, locating and looking at these quite small changes sometimes in the eyes and where they're looking, that can be quite a tricky perceptual task. And maybe that's um, something that older people find more difficult due to visual changes. And I don't know what the answer is as to why these age differences are happening. They're just some things that we'd like to explore in future research. But I think um, the finding that we have these age differences in gaze following have some potential implications that maybe as people get older, they're sharing attention with other people less, and this might have an impact on communication particularly if there are these intergenerational differences between younger and older adults in how much they're tending to share and follow gaze cues. So that's a kind of um, a background to uh, gaze following, one way in which we use social cues to try and communicate with people. Another important thing that we do a lot of every day is on trying to understand people's um, emotions. So here's an example of an emotion perception test that's used a lot in psychology. So you might see a picture of, I'm afraid, another disembodied face, and this time even hair has been taken off the face. But you see a face and you're asked to decide which label, which of the words there, you think best describes the emotion being shown in the face. If anyone wants to, you could enter your thoughts on that in the chat at the side, or you might just like to have a look at it and think, which emotion you think best describes what's being shown there. And this kind of emotion perception task is very widely used in psychology and um, to try and decide, you know, what it is that's being, uh, well, how good people are picking up on these emotional cues from faces. And yes, the right answer is disgust. <laughs> good work. Um, so the right, the right answer for this one is actually disgust. Okay, so this is trying to, uh, look at in quite a controlled uh, way how good we are at picking up on emotional cues from faces. Um, and the most commonly used stimuli to look at this question are some stimuli that were gathered in the 1970s. I think that's one of the reasons why the hair is often cropped out because it does look very 1970s when you see the full photos like this. So these are examples of the six basic facial, facial expressions of emotion and um, from the work of Pollock in the 1970s. And uh, we recently did a meta-analysis, which is where you gather together lots and lots of different studies uh, of more than 100 studies looking at adult ageing and emotion perception. So how younger and older people might differ and how accurate they are at labelling facial expressions of emotion. And what this meta-analysis told us was that um, as people get older, they are not so accurate at labeling expressions of fear, of anger and sadness, the top three emotions that I've shown you there. But there aren't any age differences in identifying happiness and disgust ones in the bottom row. Now, one of the reasons that's kind of an interesting pattern is because there's a completely different literature looking at eye tracking which had indicated uh, mostly in healthy young people, but also actually in people who are suffering from brain illnesses, that fear, anger, and sadness as emotions are mostly identified by people looking at the eyes, whereas happiness and disgust are mostly identified by looking at the lower half of the face and the mouth. So there's a kind of coincidence there 
or is it a coincidence, um, that older people are worse at labeling those emotions at the top. And also those are the emotions that are mostly identified from the eyes. So is this a coincidence or is there an overlap in what's going on here? And one way of looking at that is to use the eye tracking technique again, to try and use cameras to work out where younger and older people are looking when they're making emotion perception decisions. And so um, when we use eye tracking to look at age differences in where people look when we're doing these emotion perception tasks, indeed we find that older people look more at the eyes, uh, sorry, look less at the eyes and more at the mouths when they're making emotional decisions. So these pictures on the left of the screen are heat maps that come from the eye tracking technique that I showed you before. And the red parts are the areas which are looked at most. So the top picture is where younger people tend to look and you'll see that the red areas are all around the eyes. So younger people look mostly at the eyes when they're trying to make emotion decisions. Uh, older people look mostly at the mouths when they're trying to make emotion decisions. So younger and older people are looking in different places when they make decisions about what emotion someone's experiencing. And this result has been replicated multiple times. This is one example of one study that I was involved in, but this is, has been replicated a lot of times. And this raises the question of why older people might be looking less at the eyes and more at the mouths. And one question we wonder is whether older people might be just more able to use information from the mouth region. Maybe that helps older people to make decisions. So I'm going to just whisk through a couple of studies where we tried to look at this, uh, not using eye tracking this time, just looking at how accurate people are at doing various different kinds of tasks. So uh, the, all the tasks I'm going to be talking about are these emotion labeling tasks, where again, you see uh, things like a face and you're asked which expression is being shown. And all three of these different types of stimuli come from the same type of emotion. So again, you might want to have a, a look at that. I think this is a little more of a tricky one, actually, because it's a less intense emotion this time. But you might want to have a think about which of these six emotion labels best describes um, all of these. So in order to try and understand whether we might get age differences in the ability to um, read emotions from the eyes and the mouth, we just simply showed some stimuli that were full faces. So a third of our stimuli were full faces, a third were eyes, and a third were mouths alone. And yes, that's right, sadness. So this one is all sadness that's being shown in this face. Um, and so um, we showed um, younger and older people just trials showing either whole faces, just eyes, or just mouths, and asked them to choose the emotion label in each case. Um, and what we found was when we just showed the pictures of the eyes, older people had difficulty in identifying emotions. So for them, it was a really difficult task to identify emotions just from the eyes. However, when we showed just the mouths, now, Showing people just the mouse and asking them to make emotion decisions is a really, really difficult task. People find this very difficult, but there were no age differences. In fact, older people were better at labeling um, sadness and anger from the mouse than younger people were. So this does suggest that actually maybe one of the reasons that older people are looking at mouths and doing better on some emotions than others is because that's the area of the face that they're focusing on. And that might be partly because they're good at using that information compared to using information from the eyes. And then we were kind of interested in um, whether people were being biased to use particular parts of the face when they were choosing emotion labels. And one way we could do that was to actually make the information in the eyes and the mouth compete. So here's, um, some examples of what we've done here. So in the second study, um, we use these chimeric faces. So here we have conflicting information from the eyes and the mouth. Again, it's just the joy of being experimental psychologists. We love doing this kind of thing and creating new stimuli to look at things in different ways. So in this case, we showed people faces. So you might want to look at this middle one here, and then we asked them to choose which label best describe this face. Again, if you want to have a thought about what label you think best describes this face, please do. Uh, and you might just want to think it to yourself or put it in the chat if you'd like to. So this face that's in the middle of the screen, what emotion is being shown there? 
Well, this time we've given people an impossible task because actually there are different emotions being shown in the eyes and the mouth. So in the emotion in the middle of the screen, it's actually um, happy eyes, so eyes from a happy expression and a mouth from an angry expression. In the one on the left hand side, it's actually angry eyes and a happy mouth. But we really were pretty cruel and we made people choose one label. And we were looking to see whether people tended to choose the label that matched the eyes or the mouth when they were forced to make this kind of decision. And we found indeed that older people were more likely to choose the emotions from the mouth region. So if you look at the one in the middle, older people would be more likely to choose anger as the correct answer. But younger people were more likely to choose the emotion from the eyes, so they would have been more likely to choose happiness as the correct answer. So in this case, uh, we again found that there were these age differences in the way people were choosing information from different parts of the face. So what happens if we kind of cover up all the information from the mouth and you only have the information from the top half of the face? How would older people do in that situation? We predict that that would be really difficult for older people because the information they rely on most is in the mouth. Well, we have a natural experiment because we live in the times of COVID and in many of our interactions, our mouths are covered up. The top half of our face is visible, but the bottom half is not. And this is particularly the case in healthcare settings. So we predict that this will be cause particular difficulties for older people when they're trying to understand emotional cues, because we know as you get older, you depend more on cues from the mouth. So in the third study in this little series, then we um, looked at age differences in emotion perception. So exactly the same task again, but this time we have some faces that have no face mask. We have some that have a full face mask and some that have what's called a clear mouth mask. So these were developed really for communicating with deaf people, but we thought it would be interesting to see if this was something that was beneficial to older people compared to having a full mask. So again, what we do is show these faces with the different masks on or no mask and ask them to label what emotion is being shown. And what we found was that the age differences were greatest in the full mask condition. So what that means is that uh, older people um, are worse emotion perception generally, but they're much worse when their full mask is on and they only have the information from the eyes. And conversely, when we have a clear mouth mask, so now the mouth itself is visible, this was particularly beneficial for older people. And um, so this has kind of got some important implications for communication. Face masks are likely to particularly impair your ability to read emotional cues if you were older. And I think this has implications for healthcare settings as well. We've also found in some separate studies that um, these emotion perception tasks, so all these tasks that I'm showing you I know are quite weird and wonderful um, experimental tasks that don't really resemble how we decode emotions and communicate in every day, but we have shown that these exactly these measures do relate to people's experience of being socially isolated. So I think there is some evidence that poor performance on these kind of tasks could be something that's important in predicting social communication more broadly. And also people with poor emotion perception are likely to miss other kinds of cues, in, including cues to sarcasm, which is what I'm going to talk about as the next topic. So the next topic is going to be age differences in understanding sarcasm. And that's just making the point that we don't always mean what we say. And um, so if you think that if you were to look outside the window now when it was raining, which is not here in Aberdeen, I don't know if it is anywhere else, but um, if you were to look outside and see it was raining and you were speaking to someone and you said, I'm happy to see the rain, you might mean what you say literally, you might be happy to see the rain, or you might be being sarcastic and you mean the completely opposite Oh no, it's raining. So how can you tell whether someone means what they say, whether they're being literal or whether they're being sarcastic? Well, the context often helps you. So if it's been raining for weeks and it rains again, someone's more likely to be being sarcastic. If it, on the other hand, it's been dry for weeks and this is a keen gardener, then they might genuinely be happy to see the rain. But also there are other non-verbal cues that might help you to decide whether someone's being sarcastic. So if someone says, oh, I'm so happy to see the rain, then the tone of voice perhaps 
the bodily gestures that people use, their facial expressions might tell you also that they're being sarcastic. So we've looked in a number of studies, there are adult age differences in detecting sarcasm. And here's an example of a kind of task that we might use as a kind of yet. Um, so Vicky had bought tickets for her and John to go to a show. Um, but the, the show turned out to be really boring. And John said, that was a fantastic play you took me to see. And then we'd ask people, what did John mean when he said that? Uh, and we'd ask them to tell us whether, they, whether we thought um, the meaning was literal. So John meant it was a good play or that John meant that it was terrible. So in other words, his underlying meaning is the opposite to the literal meaning of the words. So this is where you kind of might have um, different ways of trying to detect whether someone's being sarcastic. And um, in these studies, this is just an example of data from one of the studies, we've tended to find that older people are less accurate in detecting sarcasm than young people are. So the graph I'm showing you here, uh, the kind of left side of the graph is how accurate people of different age groups were in determining the act in understanding the meaning in a literal story uh, and there was no age difference whereas on the other side of the graph we had sarcastic stories and there we found a big age difference so the older people were um, less accurate than younger and younger and middle-aged people at detecting the sarcasm and understanding it and these age differences were not explained by more general changes in cognition things like changes in memory ability but your ability to do this kind of task was related to your ability to decode emotions from facial expressions. So there seems to be a link between these two quite different types of social decoding, how good you are at reading emotional expressions and how good you are at deciding that someone's being sarcastic when they say something to you. Um, and in some more recent studies, we've been looking at not just understanding of sarcasm, but also the production of sarcasm. So in these studies, um, we've been asking people to uh, produce literal or sarcastic remarks. We were interested in whether younger and older people use the same type of cue when they were trying to get across sarcasm. And we found that they did use the same kind of cue. So if you're trying to um, indicate that you're being sarcastic, you would maybe roll your eyes, smile a bit more, uh, have a very exaggerated vocal tone. And younger and older people both use these same kinds of cues, but older people use them less, especially the kind of eye rolling, kind of really dramatic gesture to indicate sarcasm. As people got older, they use that kind of cue less. We've also done some questionnaire studies where we just asked people about their attitudes to an experience of sarcasm. And in those, we found that older people reported using sarcasm less than young people and that they found it um, less amusing, less funny and less appropriate than young people did. So there seems to be these generational differences in attitudes to sarcasm as well. So why might this matter? Maybe a lot of the time sarcasm is seen as being this really negative thing that is kind of mean. But actually, there's evidence that that's not always the case. If you take someone to see some, a fantastic play uh, and you actually thought it was really quite rubbish, um, telling them straight out that you thought it was rubbish can actually be quite harsh. And there's some evidence that if you said, oh, no, it was great uh, in a sarcastic way, that's actually a more gentle way of getting the same message across. So sarcasm is not always a mean thing. It can be a mean thing, but it's not always a mean thing. And there's some evidence. There's a really nice study done um, looking at people with dementia. Um, and their partners, finding that actually, um, in many cases, people with early dementia and their partners still used shared kind of quirky humor and things like sarcasm to communicate. And this was really important in maintaining a social bond, these kind of things that you've developed with time with somebody. So sarcasm and other forms of non-literal language and humor can be used to kind of generate and create social bonds. So I, I don't think they're completely trivial. And also, if younger and older people are um, differing in the way that they use and understand sarcasm, that could result in miscommunication across the generations as well. And so understanding sarcasm is one example of 
um, trying to mind read, trying to understand what someone's intention is. You can't just tell from the literal meaning of what you say, you have to try and get into their head to understand what they mean. And more broadly, and that's an example of trying to understand someone's mental states. Um, and so this idea of trying to understand someone's mental states, this kind of is sometimes termed theory of in case that helps anybody and you're familiar with that term, trying to understand what someone else believes. This has been looked at a lot in relation to children, but less so in relation to adults and in relation to aging. And I guess the idea here is that, uh, again, people don't always mean what they say, but also we often misinterpret and misunderstand someone else's intentions and beliefs. So the kind of classic task in the in the literature on children, which has looked at this idea of understanding other people's mental states, is a false belief task called the Sally Ann task. So I'm just going to describe this a little bit because it's such a classic task and it's the basis for the way that adult tasks are generated as well. So Sally um, puts a ball into her basket and then she goes out of the room and leaves Anne alone. But that turns out to be a bad idea because Anne is sneaky and Anne takes the ball out of the basket uh, and puts it into the box. Sally then comes back into the room. And then the question that participants are asked in this kind of study is where will Sally look for her ball? And in order to solve this kind of task, you need to be able to um, kind of inhibit the fact that you know that the ball is in the box. Anne knows the ball is in the box, but Sally doesn't know that. Sally thinks that the ball is in the basket. So the correct answer to where will Sally look for her ball is the basket. And children aged around four or five can begin to start solving this kind of false belief task. Um, and we have all kinds of slightly cruel and unusual ways that we take this kind of task and make it more complex and involved and then it becomes tricky for people of all ages to do. Um, and so there's been a a bunch of recent evidence that as people get older, they have more difficulty in judging other people's mental states in this kind of task, in, this, in a slightly more complex version of this task compared to younger people. And it's not surprising to note that this is related to cognitive changes with age because this is a cognitively demanding task. Um, but just a recent study we did, that I just wanted to say a little bit about and um, so this study was interested in whether there were cultural differences in these age effects on mental state understanding. So we investigated this, uh, these aging effects in both the UK and Malaysia. And this work uh, was led by Yong Min Hui in um, Malaysia. The reason we were interested in this is because there's actually quite a bit of evidence that children from uh, Eastern Asian countries like Malaysia develop mental state understanding more slowly later than children in the West. And this is not true for most cognitive abilities, which were either developed at the same time or in some cases like numerical abilities uh, developed earlier in many Eastern cult cultures. And it's been argued that the reason there's a slower development of mental, mental state understanding in Eastern countries like Malaysia is because they're more collectivist and there's less focus on learning about another individual's mental state Whereas we are more individualists in the West and more interested in what that individual is and what they think about things. That's the theory. So we thought it'd be really interesting to look at mental state understanding in the UK and Malaysia. And we predicted that if these findings from children kind of uh, were relevant, that we might find particular difficulties uh, in mental state understanding in older people in Malaysia. And that's exactly what we found. So age differences um, between younger and older adults in this mental state understanding were greater in Malaysia than the UK, but these were not just in all older adults in Malaysia, they were in a particular group. So in other words, these findings were mediated by cognitive capacity and by education. So just the bit in bold there, older Malaysians who had low levels of education, so this was generally people who hadn't completed high school, and also had lower working memory capacity, they tended to have more problems with mental state understanding. Whereas highly educated Malaysians, this was almost like a protective factor. 
uh, education was a protective factor and they were not showing these difficulties of mental state understanding. And in the UK, there were smaller age effects. So there were age effects, but they were smaller and they were less related to education and capacity, cognitive capacities. So why might, again, these slightly weird tasks matter? Well, there's, we have some evidence that they're related more broadly to communication skills. And there's also been some really interesting evidence from Italy um, that um, ability to do these kinds of quite abstract mental state tasks predict the quality of social networks. So older people who have poorer ability to understand mental states in these belief tasks um, tend to have uh, fewer and less supportive friendships specifically. So there's kind of interesting evidence to link together mental state understanding and broader um, social functioning. So just to sum up briefly then, um, older people tend to follow gaze less. Uh, they have more difficulty in labeling emotions and they look more at mouths than eyes. Also, they seem less attuned to other people's mental states, including things like um, uh, intentions as measured by the sarcasm tasks or beliefs. And there might be perceptual and cognitive changes that occur with age that could influence these. Uh, and those may interact in quite complex ways with cultural and educational, cultural and educational influences. There might also be motivational differences, how much older people are interested in disembodied heads. Maybe we need to make our tasks much more like everyday life in order to really understand the nature of the age differences. And there might be these cohort changes in etiquette and social appropriateness. Um, and I think that these results have implications that older people may miss out on important social signals, for example, when face masks are used in healthcare settings. And we need to better understand the links between these age differences in social cue, decoding and production and how this might impact on how younger and older people communicate with each other, intergenerational communication. We know that older people who are misinterpreting or missing social cues may have more problems with social relationships. We know from a completely separate kind of health-based literature, that older people who have poor social relationships, that has consequences for mental and physical health. So I think I'm really keen to try and understand how all these things fit together. So it's important that we understand more about the nature of these generational differences and what they mean for everyday life. I just want to thank everyone not everyone, this is just a subset of people who've been involved in collecting all of this data and all of these studies, particularly everyone from Aberdeen who's been involved. Gillian Slesser has been my collaborator on many of these studies and many, many of the people who've contributed to everything to do with these studies have been undergraduate and postgraduate students at the University of Aberdeen, just so important in every aspect of this research. Also my inter international collaborators and the funders, and just to finish up by saying, I'd be really interested to hear any questions, any just any thoughts or comments you have about any of this as well. Uh, hopefully there'll be time for some of that now, but also if something occurs to you afterwards, feel free to email me. And if you're interested in taking part in any of these crazy online studies, also feel free to email me and I can tell you how to do that as well. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry, I've crammed a lot in. It's just because I'm too enthusiastic about the topic. Not at all. Thank you, Louise. That was so fascinating. It was so interesting. And you did manage to get so much information into that time. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions and there was so much to cover there. If anybody has got questions that they would like to ask, please simply type them in the chat and I will read them out on your behalf. We'll just give you guys, you know, a wee minute to get your thinking caps on and get something typed out. <laughs> Undercover. <Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> Process. <laughs> While we're waiting, I'll ask, um, what's kind of, are you doing more on this front at the moment or do you have any other very exciting projects coming up that you're going to be involved with? So I guess the project that we were most excited about was trying to look at eye contact and gaze following, how people look at each other and follow each other's gaze in actual real interactions. So this involved doing things with mobile eye trackers. So you literally wear a pair of glasses, it's just a pair of glasses that monitors 
where you're looking and how much you're looking at people. And in March 2020, we were just about to do that study of two people sitting close by to each other, looking at each other and all this kind of thing. And guess what? We had to stop doing that. And we haven't been able to restart that yet. So I'm really keen to do some studies which are much more about how people interact and use their social cues in really everyday settings and everyday interactions. I'm really keen to do research into that because in the end we are using all these quite artificial tasks and disembodied heads and people floating in space and things like that. So that's what to me is in some ways the most exciting thing is trying to look at real interactions. It's just that the pandemic has kind of made that more difficult. It's amazing the number of things the pandemic's got in the way of, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, the first question we've got is, do you think generational differences in social cues are going to increase the generation now having been brought up in such a digital age? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And actually, uh, just very recently, um, there was a study done looking at people's understanding of uh, whether um, the use of um, like emojis and stuff was being done sarcastically um, and so things like that so the way that we use you know we use these different ways of communicating now and there was some evidence that um, older um, computer users were not picking up on some of those cues that um, an emoji had been intended in a kind of sarcastic manner and so you can see why exactly all the way we do these things kind of changes over time and that's something else i'm really interested in is the kind of idea that this might be to do with an aging process but also we might have these historical changes and i'm really fascinated in understanding what those might be i'm not a historian but i'd love to work with a kind of kind of modern historian to look at how those things might change across the generations as well no that'd be really interesting um, the next question is, is there any work being done on the impact of mask wearing in health settings and what might improve communication for older people? Oh yeah, this is such an important thing. So there has been some work done on, um, um, particularly on deaf people, um, because this idea of having a kind of clear mouth mask came from that so that people could lip read basically. But as people get older, I mean almost the biggest, most guaranteed change as you get older is that your hearing is likely to get worse. And so this is so important, not just from the kind of emotional side of things like I was talking about, but also in any kind of communication. I think it's one of the reasons that older people might look at mouths more is because of hearing changes. And so this seems to me to be really fundamental. If in all of our healthcare settings, we're covering up that key aspect of the face, that's so important. Um, now, I'm not aware of any studies that are being done that really look at that in healthcare settings. And to be honest, you can understand why right at the moment, trying to do any studies in healthcare settings that are not just directly about how do we stop COVID is incredibly difficult. But I would really like to do this because I don't think face coverings and full on face masks are going anywhere in healthcare settings in any time soon. I think we're going to be using them for a very long time into the future. And so I actually think that maybe when things just calm down a bit, I'd love to look into that a bit more and perhaps get some medical collaborators to try and look at exactly that issue um, of how that might impact on how people understand things and particularly how older people who are the major users of healthcare, how they might be impacted for that. You know, it could be slightly trivial things like not being able to see that someone's smiling and maybe that doesn't matter, but things like when you're smiling, that influences the way that people understand what you say and I think it's actually quite important all these little non-verbal cues do make quite a lot of difference to the way we interpret things so I think it would be really interesting to look at that in more detail and particularly to look at so here's a situation as well whereas it's not just about this might be a problem but we have a potential solution by having clear masks and so finding a practical way in which clear masks could be used because I know there's actually lots of practical problems with the kind of clear masks that they have at the moment. But finding a practical solution to that, I mean, that could instantly solve the problem as well. So I think this is not just in what the problems might be, but we actually have a possible solution if we can get it to work. I, 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 I've got it on my list. I want to contact some mask manufacturers to see if we can really do something with that, because I think it would be so interesting. It's really complex, isn't it? It is. 
Um, so this is the last question we've got. So just to remind everyone that we have got time for you know a few more if you want to put them in, um, you can you can do that now. Um, the next question is: Is there best practice on helping the generations understand each other better? Um, that's a brilliant question, and I I think there's so much evidence being collected on exactly this question at the moment. So there's really a lot of interest just now in the idea of trying to encourage intergenerational contact um, is a really big topic at the moment and there's a brilliant group in Scotland called Generations Working Together and um, I think it's Scotland not UK wide there might be an equivalent um, group in England actually but anyway Generations Working Together and their whole ethos is about trying to encourage younger and older people to have contact um, and I think there's so much research going on at the moment that I'm not sure there is a best practice guide right yet, but I think it's the kind of thing that really in the next year or two we're going to know an awful lot more about because there's just so much research going on in this area and there's so many amazing schemes or there were so many amazing schemes being done to try and encourage this kind of intergenerational contact. And of course, a lot of this has gone online now and that's not perfect, but it's better than nothing, right? I mean, having online kind of communication is but is better than, than nothing. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that in, in the sense that there is a set of guidelines at the moment, but I would be really hopeful that there will be soon just because I know how many projects there are going on in this area just now. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question is, with masks, do you feel that most people can tell if someone is smiling through them just by viewing their eyes? Oh yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but I certainly very often, if I'm like in a, in a shop, and you know, I I kind of smile at somebody to try and say, oh yeah, thanks. And I find myself doing this ridiculous smile underneath the mask because you're so desperate to kind of show that you're. I mean, smiling is a communication. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for somebody else. And you do this kind of ridiculous kind of thing where you can kind of feel yourself pulling your face into contortion just to try and show that you're smiling. I think it's worse when you've got glasses as well. So even more and lots of hair everywhere. It's all kind of hidden then. And um, so yes, so there's some actually there's a really interesting. Um, whole separate topic on that which is about genuine versus um, non-genuine smiles so there's this idea that genuine smiles you crinkle up this bit of your face as well as the kind of mouth smile whereas um, when it's kind of more of a polite kind of more posed smile it's more just about what your mouth does and your eyes don't so the idea that your smile reaches your eyes when it's a really genuine um, smile or whatever um, and so I think I, I think that particular, I think what probably happens is that we do tend to exaggerate because of that. Uh, and so you can tell from the eyes. It's just a hell of a lot more difficult to tell from someone's eyes that they're smiling than when you can see their mouth. So you can tell, but it's much more difficult. Yeah, it's the same here when Chloe was also saying that, yeah, we're doing that same thing, really exaggerated smiles. <laughs> um, the next question is, have you done any research into age differences in detecting sarcasm? in the written word, for example, text messages? Um, yes, we have. And actually, I didn't really talk about this, but I think this is really interesting, actually. So we ha I haven't looked at text messages, but someone called Ruth Fillick in another unit, Birmingham, in Birmingham, she has looked at this um, and did find the older adults struggled more to get a sarcasm in text messages and of course the information on text messages is really sort of poor you know you don't you don't get there's it, it, it's they're short there's not much context there um and what i mean what, the kind of thing that we've done we've done some story some studies where we look at sarcasm understanding in stories well if you think about it, reading fiction just reading what's on the on the page and, and there we find these really big age differences that older people are doing are struggling to see the sarcasm from the written word. But we also um, have used some video tasks where people see someone being sarcastic. And there you have all that additional information about tone of voice and gesture and things. And the age differences there are much smaller or sometimes they're not there. And I think that's because actually in those cases, particularly where people are using quite exaggerated ways to get sarcasm across there, people are picking it up because you have more information to help you understand 
the sarcasm. And there the age differences were non-existent and much smaller. So I think in text messages, that's really tough because then the information is so minimal, you really have to pick it up from very subtle cues. Whereas once you have all of the kind of, um, all of the cues at your disposal, the tone of voice and the gestures and the facial expression, you know, sarcasm often is about exaggeration and then it becomes easier. So yeah, I think uh, text messages are probably the most difficult uh, from that point of view. And we all know what it's like to misunderstand a text message or an email. I mean, there's so much of that business in emails. I think that's why we all use emojis so much now, because so often what you say in an email can come across as being really kind of stark uh, and the emojis there to try and lighten it a little bit. Yes, I think I am very guilty of putting smiley faces in a lot of emails just to just to prove that I'm, it's, I'm fine about it. I'm not in a bad mood. <laughs> I'm human. I think that is it for questions. Um, I think that's everything we've got just now. So um, I just like to say a huge thank you, um, Louise, for taking the time this afternoon to go through this with us. It was absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you for all the really interesting questions and the opportunity. Um, and as I kind of said in my talk, uh, none of this could have been done without the brilliant contributions of students from Aberdeen University. And I just, it's just nice to give something back to the community, basically. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, you never know, we'll be calling on you again, I'm sure, in future to come back and talk to us. <laughs> well, thank you. And I hope you enjoy all the other ones in the, um, in the series as well. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for taking the time to join us today. It's absolutely fantastic that you were able to join us. We really appreciate it. And we'll hopefully see you at another one soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.